Hi, this is Dr. A. So welcome to your very, very last lecture. So this is Diagnosing Infections, and thanks for hanging in there. I know it's been a really fast-paced and kind of crazy four weeks, but, um, you know, it was, it was really good, I think, anyway. All right, so I'm going to play this video. Um, I, I think you might be able to hear it slightly in the background. I want to show you what the newest in microbiology automation is. And you'll hear the music a little bit in the background. Turn it down. So microbiology is actually one of the last areas to get automation. So automation has been around the lab, you know, especially chemistry and hematology and all of that. And so we have finally got a system here in the lab that's uh, automated. And so uh, this lady is a micro manager. And so you can see how they normally work with plates and do tests and stuff on the colonies. And it's a very manual process, okay? But it's very important, obviously, you know, diagnosing the right, you know, the right infection so you get the right treatment. So you can see them doing strict plates, all of this by hand. So this is a system, it stores all the plates and everything. And there's only a few of these in the system. Uh, everything is barcoded, as you can see, so proper identification. So we have here some inoculation. And then uh, you can see here the streaking. So it's a magnet that's moving a, uh, a magnetic ball back and forth, and that's how the streaking is done. And uh, so this is a very, very quick uh, and accurate system because you don't have, you've eliminated a lot of the human component, which is where mistakes often are made. So with, with a system like this, uh, with such automation, you can get results quite, quite a bit sooner. So they're saying in their facility, um, they managed to get results out six hours sooner. And they can be interfaced straight with the pharmacy so that as soon as there's an ID that's popping up with the sensitivities, they can verify with the pharmacy. And so they can get right away, you know, what it was, what it's sensitive to, and they can verify that they have the correct treatments. So of course she talks about here, basically, the sooner you get a proper identification of a microorganism, the sooner you can get a patient on the correct treatment. And so that could mean a shorter hospital stay for that patient, lower healthcare costs and all of that. You can see they're doing uh, slides there, they can do gram stains and stuff, and anyway, so this has been really a revo revolutionary in micro, and so it's the BD Kiestra, again, there's not a lot of them, uh, but there are more and more of them, and there are, there, you can, there are some in Memphis that are using this, so AEL in Memphis has a system like that, it's really, really cool. And they actually run the cultures for the whole Baptist system uh, here in Jonesboro and in Memphis and stuff. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of show you some of the new stuff there um, in microbiology. So it's, it's really exciting. Um, and so um, we're going to look over a case again. So this is a 35-year-old accountant that presented to his physician with a steady burning pain just right of the midline of the abdomen region in an area one to four inches above the belly button. The pain usually followed meals about one to three hours. He had several episodes of vomiting, which included frank blood, which is, you know, blood that's visible that you, you know it's there. On physical examination, the patient had no fever. He appeared generally well. He had no evidence of weight loss. He showed slight rebound tenderness in the upper abdomen and an occult blood test revealed the presence of blood. So occult blood, that's hidden blood, if you will. And that's what you would do that to look for blood in the stool. Uh, in a stool that's obviously that just looks normal, looks like normal brown poop. And, uh, but there could be some blood in there and uh, it could be hidden because uh, it's very diluted or uh, it's been broken down by the bacteria and stuff like that. So we do that test to check for that. Okay, so he had blood in the system. So 
Um, we've covered this already, but we're going to go back over signs and symptoms. So those are the warning signals of disease, and they can actually point you in the direction, you know, of diagnosing an infection. So again, a sign is an objective evidence of disease as noted by an observer. So if you as a nurse or a respiratory therapist or a healthcare worker can observe and chart the sign objectively, regardless of what the patient says, or if the patient is like unconscious or whatever, then that's a sign. So a fever, right, um, an assessment of heart rate, um, breathing per minute, all of that kind of stuff, a rash, those are signs, okay? A symptom is subjective evidence of a disease as sensed by the patient. So feeling fatigued, uh, feeling nauseous, pain, all of those are symptoms. So those are something that you have to take, that the patient has to tell you and you basically have to take at face value. And then the syndrome is a disease that's identified by a certain complex of signs and symptoms. So it's really when you put these signs and symptoms together, it points towards something. So, um, you know, the one that's easily recognizable are, is the flu syndrome. So, you know, the, the achiness, tiredness, fever with the body, you know, the body aches and stuff, but then uh, maybe some congestion, some coughing, sore throat, all of that. So that would be, you take all of those together and then you, you, your body, you know, you, you may would think, oh, this is flu-like, maybe I have the flu, right? So that would be a syndrome. Okay, so uh, your first question, and I have this here. I'm going to show you just a second. List the signs and symptoms. So if to do it really cool and good, to really show you understand this, I would list put signs, list all the signs, put symptoms, list all the symptoms. And if you click on here, you can see. I just took a put a screenshot of that, and then if you X, you're back here, so you can look. You can go back and forth. Okay. So uh, his diagnosis is he has ulcers. So there are ulcers that typically develop in the stomach or the duodenum, right? And um, they're bleed because it's an eating way of the lining of the stomach, and it can get down to where you know the circulation is and the little arteries is. Or now it can be really bad, and it, it can it can burrow and get to a larger artery that's in the in the stomach and then can cause in a lot more bleeding. So um, since he vomited blood and stuff, then there's definitely, so it's, it's gotten to where there's some blood that's going into the stomach and stuff. Okay, so the pathogen that causes uh, stomach ulcers is Helicobacter pylori. So um, once upon a time, we thought that, um, it was stress or spicy foods and stuff like that. And stress and spicy food certainly aggravates the condition, but the condition is actually caused by that bacteria. So what happens is um, you swallow it or you get it from somebody else, maybe sharing a drink or just drinking contaminated water. It is much more prevalent in places where you don't have access to clean water. So like in Africa and parts of Asia. And the bacteria gets into your stomach, and it has the capacity to survive the acidic environment of the stomach, and uh, it can burrow into your mucus lining and then and, and get into the lining cells of uh, the stomach. And the mucus lining is there to protect it, to protect the stomach, and um, this, again, this bacteria has the ability to neutralize the stomach acid and to dissolve the mucus so that it can get in and get established and grow and colonize. And the fact that your pH of your stomach is one, pH of one to two, does not phase this little guy at all. And it is treatable by an, a certain antibiotic for it. So, uh, and that's how you treat it. Um, so how is it diagnosed? So do you think, so look it up if you can, or do you think, which, which of these do you think would be what we do? So either, a biopsy sample is cultured, or you can do biochemical testing of a biopsy, or do we do serum, serol, serum blood serology tests for the antibody to H. pylori, or do we do a genetic analysis of the biopsy sample? So those are all reasonable ways to, to diagnose, but what do you know what is mostly done? Okay, so give it a guess. 
And um, so a couple of the, the most often used and seen, and again, um, this is, you know, here in this area, and it, it could also be that now there's more and more movement towards genetic testing, so genetic testing could definitely be up there as a possibility. But currently, the way we, and especially in this area, the way we diagnose it are two ways. So this is a, uh, a little test cartridge that in which you put the biopsy. So how do we get a biopsy? Well, the same way you diagnose a patient with stomach ulcers is you have to put a tube down their throat could go down into the stomach with a little camera and visualize and see those uh, ulcers. And in the same go, they can also introduce a little snipping tool that can go and grab a portion of that ulcer, clip it, and, um, and bring it back up. And then you can use that and put it in this test cartridge. And um, this is going to be a biochemical test, and I will explain it here in a minute. But it, um, it basically, if the bacteria is present, it will eventually change color. It takes a couple of days for it to, you know, fully develop. But yeah, it's pretty, pretty nifty. And then the other um, very common way to do it. So if you think about having a tube shoved down your your throat into your stomach, that's not really pleasant. It's quite invasive, and you know we try not to do too many invasive tests if we can possibly help it. And so a least less invasive test would be, um, you know, getting blood drawn. And this could be especially like maybe there's some stomach pain, but there's not been any kind of vomiting of blood. Um, maybe you get a positive occult blood, and they're not sure they want to investigate. Well, they could just order this an antibody to H. pylori. So uh, that would indicate that you have mounted an immune response against that bacteria, indicating the, that it is possibly present and actively causing problems. Of course, one of the problems I will say with antibody tests is that unless you really know what you're doing and you, you know how to interpret and the difference between IgG and IgM antibodies and all of that, that it, would, it could be harder to pinpoint whether the infection is a current one or a past one. Because once you've fought off a, a certain bacteria, you could have the antibodies present for you know, quite a while. Um, there is actually also a way to test for the H. pylori antigen in this tool. Uh, and so that's another way that, that, um, that was enlisted that you know, can work. Okay, so... There are three big classifications on um, identifying microbes. The first category is phenotypic, the second one is genotypic, and the third one is immunolo immunologic. This is gonna be on your final. This is one of your questions on your final, so you need to know these three. Okay, so phenotypic, so if you remember um, from your genetics lesson, the phenotypes are the traits that are expressed. So for a microbe, the traits that are expressed are going to be its size, its shape, how it stains, you know, with the, the cell wall composition and that kind of stuff. And then it's always, it's also going to be different biochemical properties, the presence of different enzymes, uh, its ability to break down different substrates and that kind of stuff. So when we took the biopsy of the patient and, um, and did the little biochemical test, that would be a phenotypic method, okay? The genotypic ones is simply the analysis of the microbes, either DNA or RNA profile. So it would be an RNA profile, for example, if um, it was an RNA virus, such as what we're doing right now currently for detecting coronavirus. So the way they're testing it is they're doing a PCR amplification of the samples, and then they're detecting coronavirus RNA. So that would be genotypic. Okay, and then immunologic is um, you can um, analyze the microbe itself using antibodies, or you can look at the patient's serum to look for antibodies to specific microbes. Uh, and we're going to dive deep, deeper into there. So, so looking, for example, in our case for antibodies against H. pylori in a patient's blood would be an immunologic method of detecting it. Okay, so uh, genetic means of identification are being used as a sole resource for identifying bacteria increasingly. 
you have a lab on that whole process, which I thought was really cool that um, that I found that and that they have have this set up for you guys. And but old fashioned techniques such as biochemical, serological, and morphological means are still very reliable and you know used. Uh, it's you can quickly do you know a gram stain and stuff and get at least some ideas of what's going on. So uh, even though they're kind of going to the wayside, they are still being used. And of course, there's other techniques to assist in diagnosis, and these are all imaging techniques. Uh, so you have your CT scans, your MRI scans, your PET scans, and stuff like that. Those can help in diagnosis, of course. So uh, let's start with your, your phenotypic methods. So microscopic morphology. So what they look at, you know, on the microscopic level, tiny, tiny. So light microscopy is what you would have in your average lab, in the learning labs, but also in the hospital labs. So um, with uh, the light microscope, you can see once you've stained it and, you know, put it on slide and stain it, all that, you can see the cell shape, the size, the arrangement, the different grant, the gram stain reaction, is it gram positive, is it gram negative, the acid fast reaction, is it acid fast or not. Um, you can even do uh, stains for endospores, granules, capsules, and all that kind of stuff. So that can already kind of put you on the trail of what it is. And then, of course, you have electron microscopy, which allows you to identify cell wall, flagella, pili, fimbria, and all of that. Well, I'll tell you, electron microscopy is very expensive and is not something that you're going to find in your average clinical lab. It is more than likely going to be found more in your research labs or, you know, frontline kind of uh, labs. So uh, now you can also do microscopic morphology. So micro is big as what you can visually see. Okay, so once you have plated it in on um, a growth plate and you have colonies that have developed, now you can observe with your naked eye those colonies. And so you can see what's their texture, their size, their shape, their pigments, the speed of growth. Did you get colonies after six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, two days, three days, four days, right? And then uh, their pattern of growth in broth and gelatin media. So if you have it in broth, if you go back and look at the nutritional requirements and the air requirements and stuff, is it, you know, if, is it, if it's an anaerobe, it's going to be at the top of the broth. If it's a if it's aerobes, it's going to be at the top of the broth. If it's an anaerobe, it's going to be at the bottom of the broth. If it's a facultative aerobe, anaerobe, it's going to be all throughout the broth. Um, and so, you know, those are different patterns that can help you identify what it is. This one looks, uh, shows some hemolysis on the blood auger plate. Uh, again, so that would be another thing that you can use to identify. It's microscopic, so you can actually see it with a naked eye and observe it. And my little thing is freezing up. So get, there we go. Hang on, make sure that I've got, yes, I do have the right one. Sorry about that. Going back and forth. And then you have the physiological and biochemical characteristics. So this has been the traditional mainstay of bacterial identification. Like I said, slowly being replaced by different other things, uh, like genetic especially. And then Maldi-Toff is another one we're going to talk about in a minute, in a little bit. Um, and it's based on enzyme production and other biochemical properties that are reliable and stable expressions of a species chemical identity. Um, sometimes the way I like to say it, it's like, kind of like identifying your, your kid by what they ate. So like what's missing from the fridge or, you know, uh, what kind of mess is left in the kitchen and stuff like that. And usually because they each have their own food preferences, you might could identify who was there. So bacteria have their, you know, by species, though, they have um, their own food preferences and stuff and have their uh, unique enzymes that they can produce. And so there are dozens of diagnostic tests that exist for determining, for determining the presence of those specific enzymes and assess their nutritional and metabolic activities. You can look at the fermentation of sugars, their capacity to digest complex polymers, the production of gas as it ferments the sugars and stuff like that, their sensitivity to antibiotics, et cetera, to help identify the bacteria. This is a typical uh, right here uh, biochemical test. And so what, what you would do is first you would have to have the microbe that's uh, grown out on a plate. And you would pick some of the co that colony that you're trying to identify and you would make a suspension 
of it in sterile water, right? And there's suspension. And you put equal amount of that suspension in each and single, every one of these wells, right? All of these wells get an equal amount of this bacteria. And then you incubate it for like 12, at least 12 hours. Um, and so in each of these wells is a different substrate or different sugar or something or different polymer or protein and stuff like that. And um, for example, in, in these first few here, a um, negative reaction is either clear or yellow and a positive reaction is red. And then in this series here, a negative reaction is blue and a positive reaction is yellow. Um, so anyway, the machine is, uh, de detects the stuff using spectral photometry, looks at color changes and all that. And then it would it will read it after the appropriate incubation time, and so it will it will go negative, negative, positive, and et cetera, et cetera. And then so uh, each well has an identification like a code number here, even though it looks like the same all the time. Um, it's it's fine. So um, if the of these this one is positive, then that's number four. This one's number, that, and then that makes it one, that's four, that's four, and then zero, zero, zero. And then that gives you a number, and that number, then uh, it checks it against the database, and that number matches the bacteria that's Edward C. L. And there you go. And so uh, this matching is done com completely by the computer. So the the reading of the colors is done by the, mach the, mach the machine um, and it generates this number and all that, and it comes in a printout, and then it generates your, um, you know, possible ID. Of course, if you have a mixed culture in here or cross contamination, it can really, you know, make things quite wacky and inaccurate. So um, another way, this is what we call kind of like a decision tree thing. So let's say you have some coxa on your your smear of of your patient. Okay, well, if they're, and these are some quick tests you can do. If they're gram negative, they're pink. And then uh, we, so we have already one division. So we have, it could, it could be any of those. And then there's a couple of quick tests. There's oxidase and catalase where you can uh, drop the, the reagent on the, a little bit of the colony. So you take a little bit of the colony, put it on the, um, a plate and you can you can look at it and um, some of them will do color changes on the plate and all of that and so um, if it's an aerobic gram negative cocci that's po oxidase positive and catalase positive then it could be nasiria bernamella or moraxilla if it's gram negative it's anaerobic and it's oxidase and catalase negative it could be violena ve Yolena, the can never see that one. If you cocks out gram positive, if they're catalase positive and they are in irregular clusters and tetriads, uh, then uh, so you have bubbling there on the catalase slide. Then um, if it's strictly aerobic, it's micrococcus. But if it's facultatively anaerobic, then it's going to be staph. Any of the staff, staff AB, staff aureus, all of that, and it could be planococcus also. But if it is catalase negative, and especially occurs in pairs and chains, then it's streptococcus. Because remember, they are both gram positive cocci. So the catalase test is a quick way to distinguish um, the difference between staph and strep. So there you have it. So um, as promised, the biochemical um, testing principle behind the test for H. pylori. So um, again, it's considered a rapid test. And once you've done the procedure and gotten the biopsy, um, you you put the biopsy in the vial. And if H. pylori is present, it produces a urea, urease enzyme. And that urease will rapidly split urea which is in the broth here, and results in a shift in pH, and it yields a color change. So um, negative is this yellow color, and positive is pink. And so literally, that, that little tablet I showed you with the little round, when you put the biopsy in there, you just seal it up, you wait 48 hours, you pick it up, still yellow, it's negative, pink is positive, and there you have it. Okay, so let's look at our second case. So this is a, uh, sorry, a 32-year-old woman that visits her physician with complaints of fever, 
malaise, headache, and a stiff neck. So again, this, by the way, is a syndrome, okay? She tells him that she is HIV positive, but has not been taking her medications lately because she is unemployed and cannot afford them. She has been off of her HIV medications for six months, and he suspects that she has a type of meningitis that affects HIV positive patients. So this syndrome of fever, malaise, headache, and stiff neck is a syndrome that indicates meningitis. Okay, so what kind of sample might we collect from this patient? So think about what's going on with her and list different types of samples. And in the next slide, I'm going to give you all the different types of samples. Again, we've uh, been over this already once. But uh, you can do samples like uh, saliva, sputum, and swab. So uh, throat swabs, but also nasopharyngeal swabs, nasal swabs. So currently for coronavirus, they're doing the nose swabs, right? If you were checking for strep, you do a, a throat swab, and swab the, the tonsils back there. Okay, and then a sputum needs to come from the, the lungs, right? It needs to be really like coughed up from the lungs. Okay, you can obviously draw blood. And uh, for microbiology, the point of drawing blood would be blood cultures to see if there's any organisms that are actually uh, in the bloodstream. There really shouldn't be any, but are there any in the bloodstream? Um, you could get a urine specimen um, that can pee in a cup, or if they have an indwelling catheters, you can get a sample from the catheter. Uh, it's important to get fresh urine, so the urine that's come right, just coming out of the catheter, not the urine that's been sitting in that bag on the floor for, you know, a day, if not more, not longer. And then uh, you could uh, do skin scrapings, um, and, of course, you can swab wounds, right? And you can do spinal fluids, spinal taps. Uh, you can do feces samples, stool samples. You can do vag and penile swabs and samples and stuff, uh, and uh, skin scraping with a blade. Uh, so there's skin with a swab and skin with a blade. Um, those are all different types of samples. So for our patients, since she has meningitis, it would be more likely that you would do um, a spinal tap and then potentially maybe draw some blood. I mean, she's an HIV patient, so she could have some weird stuff. Because she's running fever and malaise and all that, a lot of times physicians, especially in the ER, will go ahead and order a urine. Just, who knows? It could, you know, she could have just a stiff neck because she slept on her pillow wrong and she just actually just has a bladder infection or kidney infection, right? So uh, it's such an easy test to do. A lot of physicians will run it um, just to rule it out. Okay, so let's talk again about sample collection. I know I've mentioned this already before, but it's really worth uh, saying again. The success of identification and treatment depends on how the specimens are collected, handled, stored, and cultured. So if you get a really bad specimen, something that's not handled correctly, that's cross-contaminated and all of that, the problem is, is you're going to have either a really hard time identifying what's going on or basically you're going to be sent on a wild goose chase and be trying to identify contaminants or, you know, microorganisms that are part of a normal flora of something. Anyway, and that, unfortunately, um, takes it takes time to go through the steps to realize that what you're looking at is likely a, a contaminant. And then you have the, but is, is it a contaminant or are they really infected with this? You know, what's going on? And then uh, that already, the whole process of getting to that can take a few days, let's say a day or two. And then you're like, okay, we don't think this is correct. So let's start over. So now we're again, a few more days into the process. And so, you know, bad sample collection can really delay proper identification and could even result in prolonged hospital stays and higher healthcare costs for the patient and for the hospital. So first of all, aseptic technique is imperative. So that is a technique where you're not introducing these, um, you know, microbes that would normally be on your skin, on their skin, and the air, you're not coughing on the sample and all that. So, so it's the idea of just, just picking up what you need to pick up, just getting what you need to pick up without getting a bunch of contaminants in there. 
So um, obviously we need sterile sample containers. Uh, that is, so the urine cup should be sealed and say sterile. Uh, the swabs, you know, they should be in a sterile container. Once you open it, you know, you need to use it because it's not, it doesn't stay sterile. Okay. And uh, you can't put the swabs down on the table or stuff. You can't leave the cup open just like that without the lid. And then, of course, you need proper collection, transport, and storage are essential. So um, you need to, you know, again, like for example, in the urine, you want to, if they have a catheter, you want to get the fresh urine that's coming down the catheter, not what's been, been in the bag. Um, you need to transport it right away to the lab or refrigerate it if transport is going to be delayed because otherwise bacteria can multiply in the urine and it can cause some false readings and stuff like that. Um, and so if, you know, if, if it, there are different storage requirements for the different types of sample and meeting the proper storage uh, requirements is super important. Definitely labeling and identifying the specimens. Um, so just for example, because it's a yellow liquid doesn't mean it's, it's automatically urine. So you have to identify it. For example, peritoneal fluid is also yellowish and could resemble urine. I've seen urine that is so nasty and so mucousy and so thick that it looks like sputum and like it makes you want to like it's like what is this you know so um the person that collects the sample uh is responsible for uh, properly identifying them and so if the patient collected it let's say a urine and all that then you need to make sure you ask them when you grab that cup, is this, is this a urine you just collected? And you also want to instruct them to notify you as soon as they collect it so it's not sitting in their room for hours on end. Um, and then you need to make sure that it's properly identified, you know, name, date of birth, and all the patient identifiers that are used, not just the room number because patients move from one room to the next, right? And uh, the type of specimen and the time and date of collection. That's real. All of that is really important, especially if you have trouble tracking down something. It, it makes a big difference to know uh, to have to have it properly identified, but also to know the time um, and date of collection. So care should be taken with samples that contain resident microbiota. So we've learned about the microbiome, and there are some good guys all over the place, and we're really not interested in, in identifying them. So you really just want the infected site. So for example, for sputum samples, you want to try to avoid contamination with saliva. So you don't want them to go You want them to be hacking something up. And usually your respiratory therapist can be your best allies to collect a good sputum sample because um, they can give them breathing treatments and things that loosen stuff up. And then the patient gets the cough in. Well, if they, you know, they're, they're moving some nice sputum, then you can have them cough in a cup and you have the sputum in the cup. Okay, um, throat and there's no pharyngeal uh, samples. You, especially I think the throat ones, you really, you don't want to like scrape the tongue, cheeks and all of that, and pick up a bunch of saliva. You really want to, you know, hold the tongue down with a depressor and go straight back there for those tonsils and only swab the tonsils. Again, urine samples, they can be taken aseptically from the bladder with a catheter. So that could be uh, an indwelling catheter or it can be an in and out cath. Um, and so, of course, you have to, you know, proper cleaning and proper, there's proper ins insertion techniques so you don't, you know, introduce bacteria into the bladder. A clean catch is taken by washing the external urethra and collecting the urine midstream. So usually with a clean catch, they have some little towelettes that you give them part of the kit and they're like, okay, wipe, you know, front to back several times or for the guy, you know, wipe the head of the penis and all of that. Start peeing a little bit so you're flushing those first bacteria and then, you know, once you've peed just a little bit, you're still peeing, put the cup in there and catch what we call the midstream. So that's a midstream clean catch. Um, and so, um, any contaminating microbes from the clean catch can be differentiated from pathogens usually uh, that way, especially again with the washing and the, the first the first void being going into the toilet, that that helps eliminate a whole lot of those contaminants. Um, a dirty catches would be the first voided urine um, and it's required for certain diagnostic 
techniques and that's where they want all of it. Um, but it's, it's not usually used in micro. We do a lot of clean catch and catheter samples in microbiology. Um, and if you need to sample uh, the mucus lining of the urethra, vagina, or cervix, you can use a swab or applicator stick to, to get those samples. Skin samples, so skin can be swabbed or scraped with a scalpel to expose deeper layers. Um, wounds are usually cleansed prior to swabbing for culture to avoid collecting your normal microbiota, and you want to get in there where that pus and that ickiness is. Uh, and then, of course, any sterile material sampling, you can get blood, spinal fluid, and tissue fluids. You have to take it by sterile needle aspiration. There are some proper cleaning procedures to go through to decontaminate or you know, to clean the site, uh, the puncture site, um, and care to be taken to not you know, expose the needle unnecessarily and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, other source of specimens can be the eye, the ear canal, nasal cavity by swab, and uh, disease tissue removed surgically. So anything basically that's removed surgically can also be sent for cultures. <clears throat> Again, proper collection, transport, and storage are essential in labeling and identifying specimens, as well as providing accurate patient history are crucial by, to, to obtaining timely and accurate results. For another example would be for wounds. What if the patient has multiple wounds? You know, you need to make sure you you put the the you know wound and left buttock or you know right arm or whatever. You need to put the proper lo wound location. Another thing too, so we said we could swab, uh, you know, penis, vagina, cervical. But we can swab a wound. We can swab the throat for uh, strep. We can swab the nose for flu. Okay, so if I bring you a swab. And all I have is some patient information. What is it? What if the patient has a wound and you screen, screen in the strep throat and for flu? You have three orders. You have a wound culture, uh, a flu swab, and a strep throat swab. And you have, my favorite is you have three swabs with the patient's like chart label, and none of them are identified to where they came from. How do you know? Any, mini, mighty, mo, just going to pick, right? Because if I run the strep screen on the, the vaginal swab or the wound side, it's, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to help, right? And if I, you know, do the wound culture, you know, it may or may not, because I'll, I'll set up, I may not set up the right plate for it. So, you know, you can see how things can get really awry. So very important to put as much information as possible on that sample. So... Um, the spinal fluid test for cryptococcus neoformis, which is the type of meningitis that HIV patients get. It's like a fungal meningitis. So it's like uh, here we have these cryptococcal forms. Since their body temperature, they're going to be in the yeast form. They're a little budding yeast. Uh, if you remember, this is a negative stain. So it's an angel ink stain where the background is stained, but the organisms are not. And therefore, you can see this halo around the organisms from their capsule. And so that is um, a very typical and diagnostic of cryptococcus pneumoformans or cryptococcal meningitis. And then when you plate it on a blood auger plate, so you can see the streak plate pattern here, these little pinpoint colonies are pretty typical of it. A little kind of waxy looking. Okay, so these tests that I just showed you in that previous slide, are they phenotypic, immunologic, or genotypic? So pick that little application there. So another test, by the way, that can be done on this patient since she's HIV positive is to uh, do a blood test for HIV viral load. Uh, and we can do an HIV nucleic acid amplification test, NAT also. Um, and you can do HIV by PCR or HIV RNA test. And so these would be genotypic methods, right? So this is uh, another one that, you know, they might do to see um, what's the viral load and to see if she potentially has progressed into full-blown AIDS versus being just HIV positive. Okay, and there's other ways to test for that, but the viral load is one of them. All right, genotypic methods, so let's dive deeper into those. And the advantages of, of the genotypic methods is 
over the phenotypic ones is you usually don't have to culture the microorganisms. Although some of them can be done, you can culture them out and then, you know, take samples of that colonies and then use them to do the genotypic analysis. Um, the genotypic methods are increasingly automated and they produce rapid results that are often more precise than phenotypic methods. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of them. There's a couple of videos I have linked that I really want you to check out. One of them is the Biofire Film Array. And one of the cool things about um, testers has the Biofire, and they're like present in labs that are local right now. They're all over this region and they're being increasingly used, is that what you can do is with one test, you can test for a whole bunch of stuff. That usually it's system specific. So they have a respiratory one and a GI one. And so for the, the respiratory one, they can check for everything that can cause different respiratory infections. So that, you know, if you have respiratory symptoms, you know, Maybe you have bronchitis, maybe you have pneumonia, maybe you have pneumonia caused by a bacteria, such as strep pneumo, but, or maybe you have the flu and you influenza is causing the problem, or maybe you now you have coronavirus, right? Like, so um, not sure if they have adapted it to, to include coronavirus, but I bet they're working on it to, to have that. So they have a whole list of all the different bacteria, all the different viruses, and even the protozoans and stuff, they, they can detect testoplasmosis and other things like that. So all these potential uh, pathogens that can be uh, possibly infect the respiratory system, and it's all run in one test, and it's because it's using genotypic method. I'll, I'll explain to you in a little bit. We're going to talk about microarrays here in a few slides, but that's that's one of the, the new ones you really should be aware of. And then another reason to use genotypic methods is there are viable non-cultured microbes. So those are microbes that cannot be grown in the laboratory. We haven't figured out what they want to grow, and we don't have it. And so um, we have, you know, identified a whole bunch of microbes as part of my, our microbiome and all that by these genotypic methods, which we couldn't culture on, on you know, blood our plates and things like that. So um, if you remember PCR, um, it results in the production of numerous identical copies of DNA or RNA molecules within hours, and it can amplify even a minute quantity of nucleic acid present in a sample. It is usually the first step in any kind of genotypic method. It's like first, you, we, get, we get the sample, first we do, we do PCR with it so we can amplify and have enough to, to, to do genetic sequences or other things, other tests. The hybridization test, they make it possible to identify a microbe by analyzing segments of its genetic material. The probe is a small segment of either DNA or RNA that's known to be complementary to the specific sequences of nucleic acid that is in that microbe. And the probes are fluorescently labeled uh, to an enzyme that triggers a color change when the hybridization occurs. So the probe is part of the reagent, right? And so what we do is Let's say you have a positive blood culture, and we have gram-positive cocci in that blood, you can incubate the sample here with this nucleic acid probe with a fluorescent molecule and a little peptide and all of that incubated. And what happens is that little probe is going to go, uh, it's, a, um, ro it's a probe that binds to the ribosomal RNA. And so if, if it is staph aureus, and only if it is staph aureus, it will bind to that specific uh, section there on the ribosome of this ribosomal RNA, and it will glow. And then you can look at it using a fluorescent microscope, and you, if you see that these little, uh, you know, word gram-positive coxal, these little cocci now are glowing in the dark, then you know this is for sure staph aureus, and it's not, for example, a staph epidermidis, which could be a contaminant. Okay, so pulse field gel electrophoresis uh, is an, another new method. So it involves the separation of DNA fragments that are too large for your conventional gel electrophoresis methods. Um, and this is used in epidemiological studies to uh, look at microbial subtypes and identification from patient samples. And it can uh, be used to identify and track outbreaks because we're looking at subtypes of, my, of microbes. And so... Um, we can see 
uh, trace outbreaks like where they may all come from to back to a common source. And uh, there's a net called PulseNet from the CDC. It's a big database, but um, it helps to identify outbreaks within hours versus days or weeks to track them. And so, again, using these, um, you know, the pulse field gel electrophoresis patterns and stuff. So robotyping is ribosomal RNA analysis. Uh, it's another good way to identify uh, bacteria and diagnose infections because uh, the ribosomes of these bacteria are each unique to different species, or genus and species, but species as well. And then you have all the immunological methods. So a lot of lab testing is immunologic including some of the chemistry tests like uh, drug levels and hormone levels are done by immunologic testing and uh, it's just the way they've designed some of the tests so we're going to talk about it in the in the you know area of identifying microbes and infection and stuff like that so uh, the antibody response is exploited for diagnostic purposes when a patient sample is tested for the presence of either specific antibodies to a uh, suspected pathogens or you can also actually test for the pathogen itself um, looking for the antibodies is often easier than testing for the microbe itself, especially if that microbe hides really well or hides inside of cells and stuff. Uh, the lab kits are available for immediate identification of a number of pathogens. So some of the pathogens that are commonly identified by immunologic methods would be your rapid strep tests, or strep uh, pyogenes for your strep throat, RSV tests on babies looking for respiratory syncytial virus, the C. diff test on your patients that have diarrhea and um, HIV, rapid HIV test. So, um, and your flu swabs, your, your rapid flu tests are all uh, done by immunologic methods. Um, and on those, those you know, we're using antibodies to detect the pathogen in the swab. And uh, you can use it to determine the immunologic status of a patient. So. Uh, maybe they lost their immunization records. You want to see if they um, are indeed immune to uh, hepatitis B. Well, you can check hepatitis B antibody titers and stuff like that. Uh, you can use them to confirm a suspected diagnosis. So if you suspect to have XYZ and there's an antibody test for that and it's pretty rapid, then you can do that. Or again, just, just uh, you know, you look at the patient's throat. Mm, looks like the strep throat. You have these white patches and all that kind of stuff. Well, Let's just swab them, send them to the lab, and we'll, you know, get the rapid strep test, and we'll confirm that it is indeed strep. So, and you can use it also to screen individuals for disease, and so that's where we're, um, where some of the coronavirus testing is kind of going. Uh, some, um, it's not, I was, it's not all of them. So I know some of the testing is like you have to have signs and symptoms before they'll test you. But there are some situations in which uh, they will screen you. Um, so, for example, my uh, boss at ASU, her son just got, um, he, he got in, he's an Air Force cadet at the Air Force Academy. And uh, he, she just dropped him off uh, a few weeks ago. So it was, you know, mid-July is when she, she dropped him off. Um, and, I'm sorry, mid-June not mid-July, mid-June. Mid-June is when she dropped them off. And one of the first things they did is they screened every single one of these cadets for coronavirus. And so um, that would be an example of screening individuals for disease. This is where you just randomly are swabbing everybody, uh, you know, that's coming through and you're looking for positive cases. Um, obviously, this would be especially if they're asymptomatic. Okay, so serology can help you answer a couple of questions. So for one, this one question would be, for example, does a patient make antibodies towards a microbe? Okay, so that's the first question. And so uh, in this little uh, diagram here, you have two patient samples, one with the little blue antibodies, one with the little purple antibodies. And then you have a known microbial agent. So let's say our, our patient case, uh, Cryptococcus neoformans. So this is our patient here. This is a different patient and that doesn't have Cryptococcus, okay? And so, um, and then this is an antigen of Cryptococcus neoformans. And so you mix them, so you put the antigen there, 
And then uh, you put the antibody from the patient in each of the wells there. And then you mix them and you, you wait for it to react. If um, the, and usually these antigens are actually coated on like latex particles and stuff like that. If the antigen is there at present and um, to the, if the antibodies are present to that specific antigen, those antibodies were anti-cryptococcal antibodies, they will react and cause clumping that becomes visible to the naked eye. If the antibodies that were in the patient, because everybody's got antibodies, are not to the cryptococcal uh, neoformis antigen, there will be no reactions. There's no antigen on the body binding that happens and no precipitation, and this remains kind of smooth and negative. You don't see any kind of clumping. Okay, so that's a quick way using a known antigen that was usually as a, you know parts of a microbe of some sort to identify whether the patient has made antibodies to that uh, antigen to that known to that microbe. And then there's the other question is what is the identity of the microbe? So in this case, you have the microbe. So let's say we have a gram-positive cocci, but uh, we have two different gram-positive cocci here. We call it maybe one is Staph aureus, the other one is Staph epidermidis, okay? And uh, you have antibodies here of known identity. So in our example, let's say these antibodies are to Staph aureus. And you incubate them with each of these sample. And the sample where it's Staph aureus is present, you're going to have the clumping and the vis vis visible reaction right there. If it's staph epidermidis, or another gram positive cocci could be, for example, strep. If it's one of those and not staph aureus, there will not be any reaction. You get a negative reaction. So you can, so this one is we're looking for an antigen on the surface of a microbe, and we use known antibodies to detect it. This one we're looking for unknown antibodies or antibodies where we suspect might be present and we're using known antigens to detect them. So either way, we're capitalizing on that antigen antibody reaction to uh, use them for diagnostic purposes. Okay, so what kind of serology test might we do on this patient? So this is our meningitis patient uh, that is HIV positive. So just think of different types of serology you might would do. If you can just even put just one there, that would be great. Okay, so some of the general features of immune testing. Um, the most effective serological tests have a high degree of specificity and sensitivity. A lot of time, these measures are um, put in percentages, and I will tell you, they're never 100% specific and 100% sensitive. And um, these are done by doing clinical studies, and um, basically, there are some calculations that can be done uh, comparing true negatives to false negatives and true positives to false positives instead. So the specificity is the property of a test to focus only on a certain antibody or antigen and not react with an unrelated or distantly related antigen. So in our previous example, um, the test is only very specific, uh, extremely specific, if it can differentiate between Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis, and not confuse the two. If it cannot distinguish, then it's not very specific. Okay. And uh, sensitivity is the detection of even minute quantities of antibodies or antigens. So it's how low can it detect? If you have just a little bit, bam, it picks it up. Or do you have to have a lot? Because if you have to have a lot, and then you're, you didn't get a good sample, and you only have a little bit, did you end up with a false negative? simply because it's not very sensitive, okay? And so, uh, again, it reflects the degree to which a test will detect every positive person. And these, again, are generally uh, put as percentages. So visualizing those antigen antibody reactions, which you have to think, these are microscopic. This, is our, this happens at the molecular level, so we can't see it with the naked eye. We have to make ways to see it. So... The basis of immunologic testing is the binding of an antibody to a specific site of an antigen. Antibody binding to large cell surfaces, surface antigens, antigens will create large clumps 
or aggregates that are visible uh, macroscopically or macroscopically. So you could put the tumor under a microscope and see the clumps, or you can actually visibly see them with the naked eye. Right? And so this is if you use things like red cells and you cause red cells to agglutinate, like if you've uh, ever seen the ABO typing, that would be an example where uh, you use known antibodies and they agglutinate the surface antigens of the red cells. Well, they agglutinate the red cells by binding on the surface antigen and cross-linking and making big clumps of red cells that you very easily see. Smaller antigen antibody reactions or antibody antigen reactions can be observed using dyes or fluorescent reagents like we already uh, saw with the staff there. Uh, staph aureus, uh, the probe, hybridization probe example. So uh, the, the main immunologic methods are agglutination, where the micro, it involves the antibody-mediated clumping of whole cells, like red cells. Precipitation, it produces um, antibody antigen complexes in a cell-free system, usually latex particles and stuff. The RPR test is one of those. The Western blot, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that one, but is the separation of proteins followed by an antibody-mediated detection. Um, and then complement fixation is a test that involves the lysis-mediated um, lysis hemolysis of red cells. So if you have red cell hemolysis, it's positive. Uh, and then the fluorescent antibody, so again, direct and indirect. So with a fluorescent antibody, you're using a monoclonal antibody. It means it's very specific to the one thing you're looking for, and it's tagged with a fluorescent dye. Um, direct testing, you are doing an unknown specimen to known antibodies. And in indirect testing, you are using, um, it's an antibody to an antibody. Well, I'm going to explain that here in a second. And then in the immunoassays, um, so there's a whole bunch of those. There's sensitive rapid tests for um, trace levels of either antibodies or antigens. And um, for example, uh, you have radio immunoassay, uh, and this one measures bound radioactivity labeled antibodies or antigens. We don't use that one that much because who wants to mess with radioactive stuff, right? But these other one, like the ELISA, that one's widely used, uh, and it's a color test. It can be detected by machines and all of that, and this one is very very widely used, this technique. I'm going to show you a video about that here in a second. And then there's a few in vivo methods. So the TV skin test would be one of them, where you inject a purified protein derivative. This is of the tuberculin uh, protein. If you have antibodies to it, there will be a reaction. If you don't have any antibodies to it, there will not be any reaction. And you need to give it a couple of days for that to happen and to get the reaction. So let's talk about the Western blot. So um, you start with proteins um, within cell lysis are separated via um, electrical charges within a gel. So you have a sample. And uh, it's broken, you know, those proteins are loosened up and they're put in a gel. And the electrical current is applied and it separates them with, um, you know, by, by charge and also size of particles. The proteins that are in the gel are then transferred to a special filter. That filter is incubated with antibody solutions that are labeled with either radioactive fluorescent or luminescent molecules. Difference between fluorescence and luminescence. Fluorescent dyes, it's like your glow in the dark stars where you have to shine light on it and then remove the light and it fluoresces, right? That's uh, glow, in the, glow in the dark stuff. Luminescent one are your glow sticks where you have to break them and it's a chemical reaction that generates the light. So, um, the, the yeah, luminescent ones, there's a chemical reaction that happens, and that chemical reaction generates the light. Um, so once that filter was incubated with antibody solutions that are labeled, the sites of specific antigen antibody binding appear as patterns and bands, and then those can be compared to known positives and negative controls. And it verifies microbial specific antigens or antibodies in a patient's sample. Okay, so for example, for this particular pathogen, the target protein is trichinella antigen. The trichinella antigen protein was proteins were broken down and separated. You can see here they're separated there, 
here's a negative control. That's what it looks like. Here's the positive control, okay? And then uh, after these were separated, we incubated them with an, an antibody to the, the protein and then an antibody that's labeled. So this is a couple antibodies that are required for this one. Uh, and so basically what happens is you will get a, a dye precipitation here where all the proteins are from, from this reaction here taking place. And so you can see in this Western blot that you patient B and patient C both really closely match your positive control, but then patient A probably doesn't, uh, and it's probably you can consider patient A as a negative. And so it's just a pattern matching there. And um, fluorescent antibodies, of course, are monoclonal antibodies that are labeled with a fluorescent dye. The fact that they're monoclonal makes them very specific and they won't cross-react. If they're polyclonal, they can cross-react to a bunch of stuff. And usually we, we don't want those for, um, for diagnostics. Um, all diagnostics are pretty much done with monoclonal antibodies. They come from one lymphocyte clone, okay? that's been specifically activated against the antigen that you're looking for. And then direct testing versus indirect testing. When you do direct testing, you take an unknown te test specimen or antigen uh, fixed aside and you expose it to a known fluorescent antibody solution or antibody tagged solution. So known antibody, unknown antigen. You're looking to identify what this antigen is. Indirect testing the fluorescent antibody recognizes the FC region of antibodies in the patient's sera. So it's an antibody to an antibody. So if you remember, the antibody is like a Y molecule, right? So we have the, the, the ends of the Y or what binds to the pathogen, and then the, the, the tail end is what binds to white cells from your immune system stuff. Well, this is a fluorescent antibody to the tail end of the antibodies uh, in the patient serum. So it's an antibody to an antibody. And um, you can use known antigens uh, to detect patient, so that the, basically you put a known antigen, the patient antibody binds to it, and then you put an antibody to an antibody and that detects the, the presence of that, the, you know, the antibody in the serum. So, uh, for example, this is positive fluorescence here of syphilis. So, this were these were radio, uh, sorry, fluorescently labeled antibodies that were incubated with a specimen. The specimen did contain the syphilis pyrochete, and now the syphilis pyrochete is all glowing in the dark here because all the antibodies attached to it, and you can actually see it. Um, and then this test, for example. Um, it could be a pregnancy test, it could be, you know, a strep test or something like that. So you put the sample here or the RSV test there. Um, so usually you've actually extracted it with some liquid and stuff like that. Anyway, you put it, those in here to sample and then it wicks across the membrane. And um, you have on the test strip, you have antigens that are there and then if you detect for example patient antibody the if the antibodies are present they will they will bind on it and then you're going to have another one there and it's going to have a color reaction i have a video that explains it better and the control has has to always be positive it has to be there to make sure that the you had adequate sample and all of that and the test actually worked correctly so um it's a, a line, no line. So if there's a line, it's positive. If there's no line, it's negative. That's usually how those are read. So um, the on the immunoassay, the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay or the ELISA test is done. And it can be done to a lot of different things. So you, you can have them to hepatitis, to HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis A, hepatitis C, all that kinds of stuff. So it uses an enzyme-linked indicator antibody to visualize those uh, antigen antibody reaction. So instead of being a fluorescent, it's an enzyme, and that enzyme usually causes a color change. It always relies on a solid support, such as the microtiter plate, that can adsorb the reaction. Uh, so that's where the, the reaction is going to happen in that uh, well, that microtiter plate. And an indirect ELISA would be, uh, would detect microspecific antibodies. So it would be 
using antibodies to antibodies, you're detecting antibodies, right? In a direct ELISA, you're using a known antibody to um, look for an unknown antigen. So uh, that unknown antigen is probably going to be that microbe. And, okay, this video, I'm going to comment on it. Uh, let me turn it down some. Okay, so um, this is an ELISA. And so it's called an yeah, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And it's to measure specific serum antibodies, okay? And so that's going to be an indirect one. Okay, so this is a microtiter um, well plate. It usually has 96 wells in it, okay? And uh, we're just going to show you what happens in one of these. Okay, so as part of, you buy them already coded, but you code them with the antigen. So let's say this is the HIV antigen. Okay, so we, it's coded with antigen, and you, you get it from the manufacturer in there. You add your patient's serum, okay, incubate it. Patient serum has a bunch of different antibodies, and if it has anti-HIV antibodies, those will bind but then the, if these are like hepatitis antibodies or something else or strep, they won't bind. And then you'll have a wash step, and the wash step removes any unbound antibodies, okay? Then you're going to put a, a second reagent, and it has antibodies to the tail end of these antibodies, and it has the enzyme on it. Again, another wash step removes all of the unbound enzymes, and then you're going to add the substrate on which these enzymes work, and that substrate will cause, the enzyme working on that substrate will cause a color change. And all you have to do then is read the plate, and uh, it is, uh, they do dilutions and stuff like that, but the ones where you have a color change indicate they're positive, and then with the, the, the dilutions you can see what kind of tighter uh, or how positive, you will, they are. And so these two that are dark are for positive ELISA test. So that's how the ELISA works. Okay, and then the microarray, that link I uh, was telling you uh, to go, that puts in the, uh, this module on the BioFire. Um, there's two of them. There's BioFire and Molly Talk. You need to watch about BioFire to really understand what the microarray thing does. Um, and it uses, the BioFire uses PCR first, but so it's a PCR and microarray. So uh, microarrays are chips, are computer chips, and they have gene sequences from potentially thousands of different possible infectious agents. And um, the arrays are elected based on large differential diagnosis. So again, like I was saying with the respiratory panel, it's like, what are all the possible organisms that can cause a respiratory infection? What are all the bacteria? What are all the viruses? What are all the fungi, et cetera? And let's test all of those, okay? So you get you get to, to see all of them, right? Test for all of them. And so uh, microarrays can be made to contain bacterial, viral, and fungal genes in a single test. So you don't have to run thousands of tests. You get to run one test and detect a whole bunch of them. And uh, the matching sequence is hybridized into chip, and then fluorescence is detected by a computer program. And so it can read... Yellow means one thing, green something else, you know, orange, et cetera. And the computer reads the patterns and then gives you it's positive for this or this or this and negative for all the others. So go check out the BioFire thing. It's just really interesting. And then the other uh, video that I've linked in your module for you guys inserted in Maldi is the MALDI-TOF one. So MALDI-TOF stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization Time of Flight. That is a mouthful. So the, the first part, the MALDI part, is um, how, how it, it treats the sample, and the time of flight is how it detects it. So it uses mass spectrometry to detect uh, and identify uh, different bacteria. And so what happens is um, you have the, the MALDI target plate, and so it has little wells, right? So uh, one bacterial colony, so you would get some of your, you grew some bacteria on a plate, you get some of that colony, and you and you put a little bit of it right here in this well. And it has a matrix that is added that you put there for that, to, to bind that sample there. Okay. And then you hit it with a laser. It hits it with a laser. 
what this, the laser does is blast a sample into a bunch of little pieces, okay? And those pieces are ionized. So it's desorbed or it's busted off the plate, it's desorbed, and then they turn into ions as they bust into pieces. So they'll have a charge, okay? And then it sends them through a spectrometer which uses um, a difference between like uh, different magnets and charges to make uh, smaller molecules and molecules with specific charges travel faster than others. And they travel through a pathway and uh, the time it takes them to go up that pathway and then hit the detector is measured. And each, and that, that makes you, it's like, oh, it detects one, and then it detects another, and then more of this one, and then that one, and it gives you this pattern that they're like peaks over time, and each organism has a specific pattern, right? And so each genus and species has a specific pa pattern, and so you get the mass spectrum of that organism that are just a bunch of peaks, right, into, and that printout. And you, your, compu you, your computer basically matches it to all the known patterns that are on record. And once it's found a match, it's like, oh, this looks just like, you know, microbe XYZ. And that's so therefore that's what it is. If you will, it's kind of like identifying a city by its skyline, right? The different buildings and stuff like that, the peaks and valleys. If you had, if, if you were shown a skyline and you didn't know where it was, but you had a big database of all these skylines, you can match it, match it, match it, match it, match until you found, you know, compare, basically compare until you found the match. And then when you, you look at the match and you're like, oh, this skyline, this pattern is New York City or whatever, or Chicago or Seattle or whatever. And then uh, you're like, okay, it can make an identification. So it does make this kind of skyline kind of pattern. And so, um, again, I have a longer video here. I'm going to show you. This one's pretty short. Uh, and so, Maldi-Toff is present, again, in this area and there. It's used daily uh, to identify. And so, um, again, you have the Maldi part. So, this is the, the plate uh, where the sample is fixed on the matrix. Here's your laser. So, it hits it and blasts those molecules off and ionizes them and then sucks them up here through this uh, mass spectrometer. And so it's going to go through the mass spectrometer, and then this is the detector, okay? And so the time of flight is the time it takes for the molecules to fly through the mass spectrometer and hit the detector. And as it flies through, it shows you it's going to generate these peaks. So if smaller ones go faster, and then as they hit, you'll see it's going to peak, then peak, more of those, and then that one. And then the height of the peak has to do with the quantity of the molecule. And the time of flight has to do with its size. And so, yeah, it does bounce it like that. That's one of their modification and technique. But the whole Molotov, that's the basic idea, is on a matrix, hit with a laser, desorbs into ions, flies through the mass spectrometer, hits the detector in sequence, and generates a mass spectrum that's compared to a database of uh, different, you know, patterns for different bacteria. So there you go. And this is really cool technology, I think. So if you have any questions, uh, listen there. And uh, don't forget to check out those two videos. I really think they're worth your time, and they'll help you understand and uh, I know it's a little bit lengthy of a lesson, but thanks for your attention.